just that I can't. Anyway, let me come back to the second part of my speech about being a, a ambulance paramedic. And I'm going to talk to you about um, CPR, which, as you all know, is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Um, I became a bit of a specialist in cardio, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I think I prefer the acronym CPR. Um, because I studied it at great length and I was, I think, quite a good practitioner uh, of CPR. But I went much further because I should point out, and Belgium can be proud of some things that it does, Belgium, as regards its ambulance service, was one of the world leaders uh, at the time in uh, semi-automatic defibrillation. Now, semi-automatic defibrillators are used now very widely, but we, were, I say we because I was part of this effort, we um, were some of the flag wavers in this field because we opened up a whole new path of study of how to use um, automatic defibrillators outside the hospital environment. And we deployed, as the English now say, we rolled out the use of external automated defibrillators, AEDs, throughout the ambulance service uh, in Brussels. And I was one of the first paramedics to be trained in the use of these AEDs. AEDs, again, I would say, being automated external defibrillator. Now, I was very heartened. That's actually a joke. That's very good, that joke. Heartened. Get it? I was very heartened when I came in to see in the hall downstairs that there is actually an AED on the wall, just by the door to the stairwell. Um, and this shows that uh, these days in Europe, AEDs are being rolled out in swimming pools, in airports, everywhere where the public congregate, you will these, day, these days find an AED. And in the acronym AED, the important uh, letter is the A, Automatic External Defibrillator. I'll come back to that in a second. Anyway, as regards CPR, um, I trained long and hard under the auspices of the American Heart Association, the AHA, I love acronyms because I work at NATO. We have a lot of acronyms. And the AHA is the entity that governs the protocols used in CPR worldwide. Now, my initial feeling, and I'm going to positivize here for a moment, is that everybody should be able to do CPR. Uh, an example, last week, um, three of my colleagues were working in, Cha in Ceausescu's palace in uh, Bucharest. And one of my colleagues who has a problem with um, arrhythmia, with cardiac arrhythmia, and has had for many years now, um, forgot to take her pills that morning, and she keeled over unconscious. And the two colleagues who were with her in the booth didn't know what to do. They couldn't find a pulse. The reason they couldn't find a pulse is that they tried to find the, the radial pulse here in the wrist. And if you've got somebody who is very sickly with low blood pressure, possibly having a heart attack, you won't find a pulse here uh, in, the, um, in, in the radial side. You'll find a pulse here in, in the neck. And that's what you have to look for. Of course, they didn't know that. So they thought she was dead, basically. And they didn't know how to do CPR. Luckily, she wasn't dead. It turns out also that somebody um, uh, from the hotel where the meeting was taking place tried to do CPR. And she's very lucky, this woman, because if you do CPR on somebody who is not dead, you can kill them. Because you can press the heart at the wrong time. So she's very lucky she's still alive anyway. So this shows how useful and how important it is to be able to do CPR. The Swedes, for example, we were talking about the Swedish um, prison model earlier. The Swedes, for a number of years now, have been teaching all their primary school students CPR. I think this is a brilliant idea. The great virtue of CPR is that anybody can do it. It's not rocket science. Uh, anybody can grasp the principles behind CPR. I could teach any of you in 20 minutes how to do it, and you can save a life. And to me, being able to save a life with knowledge which is so easily acquired is a very desirable thing. Imagine, for example, that you're in your sitting room with your wife, husband, lover, mother, daughter, dog, cat, whatever, and that entity keels over unconscious with no heartbeat. How good would it be to be able to save them, and how bad would it be to stand there watching them die in front of you? So learn CPR. Come to me later. I don't charge. Anyway, um, so CPR, um, the American Heart Association. Let me talk now about the physiology of the heart so we can then talk a bit more about how you actually do CPR and how uh, an external automated defibrillator can be extremely useful. As you know, the heart is a muscle. And the heart is divided, as you also know, I'm sure, into four chambers. The upper chambers being called the auricles and the lower chambers, the ventricles. The important bit here to retain is the ventricle. That's where the problems lie in the ventricle. Um, you also know, I imagine, that a heart muscle beats 
in a coate way rather than an inchoate way, good English word coate, C-H-O-A-T-E, uh, in a, a useful way, um, thanks to electrical impulses. And the electrical signal is propagated from cell to cell along certain pathways in the heart wall, what's called the myocardium, the myocardium being the, the wall around the heart, the wall of muscle. And sometimes you have all sorts of problems with the propagation of the electrical wave, which makes the heart beat. If you have an electrical wave that is deviated or is stopped because there is necrosis of part of the heart muscle, necrosis being death, i.e. it dies, is no longer irrigated by blood, the cells die, they become necrosed, and then you have no more heartbeat. That's one of the reasons you might get a myocardial infarction. And a myocardial infarction means a heart attack, okay? Um, you can also have, um, you may have heard of ectopic pregnancies, I'm sure you have, which are pregnancies outside the uterus. Nasty things, not a good thing to have. Not a problem for me, but it could be for some of you. Um, you can also have an ectopic um, rhythm in a heart, which means that the actual signal for the heart to beat is no longer given by the sinus node, the sinus node, the nerve sinusale in French. The sinus node is the little um, uh, sensor that gives the signal for the heart to beat. And you can get the signal coming from somewhere else in the myocardium. And then the heart will beat, but it will not beat in a useful way. Um, rather than beating like this and actually pumping the blood, it will start to do, do, be like a jellyfish and sort of beat in all sorts of weird, uh, random ways, which means the heart, while there is electrical activity, will no longer be working as a pump, which means, again, you become unconscious and you die if you're not helped. Anyway, I've only got one minute left. Oh, my God, I've got to speak faster. Um, in between the uh, four chambers of the heart, as you know, we have the atrial and tricuspid valves, which enable the blood to flow from the, from the, from the oracles on top to the ventricles in below. And there are two sorts of aberrant heart rhythm which you can defibrillate. Uh, the two sorts are, are ventricular tachycardia, which means tachycardia means fast heart beating. So ventricular tachycardia is tachycardia of the ventricles. They're beating too fast. If your ventricles open and close at more than 180 beats a minute, normally you'll become unconscious and die because there isn't the physical time for the chambers to fill with blood before the blood is then sent out by the actual contraction of the ventricles. That's one aberrant heart rhythm that you can intervene on by way of defibrillation. The second one is... Um, I write down, I forgot what it is. It's, oh yes, it's, um, it's ventricular fibrillation. That's the worst one. If you have what they call VF, ventricular fibrillation, that means that the heart muscle in the ventricles is not pumping anymore because it is not contracting in a regular fashion. Each part of the muscle contracts differently, which means there is no pumping action. Now, those two uh, heart failures can be defibrillated. And a defibrillator, as you probably know, is basically a battery with two electrodes attached to the battery. Uh, and the great advance we made in Belgium, uh, in conjunction with the Danish fir firm called Lyardal, which provides the uh, external automated defibrillators, is that we made these things usable by the man in the street. What happens with an AED automated defibrillator is that you will take it out of its bag, you attach the electrodes to two contacts on the front of the, of the um, box, you turn it on, and it will then give you instructions, in English usually, as to what you have to do. And in theory, all you have to do is follow the instructions and you can defibrillate. Basically what you do, you put one electrode here on the right shoulder, one here on the left side of the thorax, and there the current flowing between this electrode and that electrode will go through the axis of the heart. And then if then what happens, you turn the machine on, the machine will itself analyze the aberrant heart rhythm and decide whether this rhythm can be defibrillated. And then it will say, stand clear. The machine will say, stand clear. Everyone has to stand clear. You press the button, and it will shock the heart. And you can shock the heart nine times maximum, three bursts of three shocks, using a current of 360 joules. Um, 200 joules for a child, 360 joules for an adult. Now, the problem is that on the TV, whenever this is done, it's uh, more than eight minutes. Can I carry on or do I stop? Two minutes. Okay, right. <laughs> okay, so you're going to need defibrillation in there. Um, where was I? Yes, the problem is that only these two rhythms can be defibrillated because a defibrillator is not a universal panacea, to use another medical term. 
If you've got somebody who's unconscious, whose heart is not beating, but he's not subject to either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, you have to do CPR, physical, manual, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, a mixture of massaging the heart and blowing into the mouth to open the airways. And I can explain that to you later at some stage in another speech. Um, so the defibrillator is fantastic because it analyzes the rhythm itself and tells you whether or not you can apply electrical shock. And then in theory, the person might recover. I should point out that unlike on TV and in the films, in our experience in Belgium, only about one person in 20 who is in a state of myocardial infarction could be recovered using a defibrillator or CPR, which means that basically your chances of dying if you have a, if you have a myocardial infarction are pretty high. But every now and again, it works. I can talk about all sorts of other things like um, wave burst arrhythmia and agonal rhythms, but I won't do that now because the time is up. And thank you for your attention.